In the freezing sea at the edge of the polar ice cap live three fabulous creatures. This remarkable trio has conquered the killing cold of these Arctic waters. They are the ice whales. Long weeks of darkness are over. The sun won't set again for four months. The seas where the ice whales spend the summer are frozen solid. It will be a while before the sun has the strength to soften winter's icy grasp. The polar bear can kill whales, but while the top of the world is ice covered, it hunts seals. While the great white bear spends the winter patrolling the pack ice, the Arctic's whales remain at its outer limits. They spend their lives at the edge of the ice, moving south with it in winter and north in spring. The eastern whale populations spend the dark months in Baffin Bay off the coast of Greenland. By the end of May, the ice has receded to a jumbled group of islands in the Canadian Arctic. The whales cluster at the entrance of Lancaster Sound, the famous Northwest Passage, waiting for the ice to retreat down the waterway. Sea ice governs the lives of the ice whales. The boundary where frozen sea and open water converge is their realm. As it constantly shifts and changes, melting and freezing with the seasons, the whales embrace its moods and shadow its every move. The ice now starts its annual retreat down Lancaster Sound, and it does so in the company of belugas. With its charming smile and flexible neck, the 15-foot-long snow-white beluga is like a character out of a fairy tale. Sailors call belugas sea canaries. By squeezing air out of their blowholes and changing the shape of the top of their heads, they fill the glacial ocean with an incredible repertoire of sounds. Huh? <gasps> 
The beluga's complex language suggests a higher intelligence. Their sonar system may be the most accurate of any whale, an adaptation for life in ice-cluttered Arctic seas. Navigating for miles under broken ice, they bounce clicks off the ceiling above them and interpret the echoes as a sound image of their frozen world. When snow above begins to melt, the fresh water slowly drains through tiny holes and fissures in the ice. Supercooled shoots of saline solution dribble into the seawater and hollow icicles form. The sun is unlocking the Arctic. Under the ice, strange life forms flourish. Not long after the belugas, the closely related narwhals arrive at the edge of the fast ice to wait for the big melt down Lancaster Sound. Narwhals are best known for their single spiral tusk, once thought to have been the horn of the legendary unicorn. It is an outsized tooth which can measure up to half their body length. Females are generally tuskless. In fact, they are toothless, as narwhals have no teeth to eat with. Narwhals have never been seen feeding, but it's presumed they suck their prey into their mouths. The abundance of food in Lancaster Sound is what they are here for. Their wait is nearly over. It's June, and with 24 hours of daylight, the ice now yields to the power of the sun and starts to melt. No longer compressed, held tight, the ice fields fracture. Leads and cracks penetrate for miles up Lancaster Sound, opening up new feeding grounds. This is what the belugas have been waiting for. They swim along the narrowest cracks, pushing far up the sound. Cracks can close as suddenly as they open and occasionally trap the whales, but the rewards are worth the risk. Holding their breath for up to 20 minutes and navigating by sound, the belugas swim as far as possible beneath the ice, because sheltering under its great white mantle are staggering numbers of Arctic cod. Nearly half a million tons of Arctic cod flourish in Lancaster Sound. Amazingly, these fish breed in midwinter under the ice. They are a major food source in the Arctic and support not only whales, but thousands of seals and birds. Migrant fulmers congregate in huge flocks to feed in the open water at the entrance of the sound. The resident walrus are extremely dangerous at this time of year. Ice still covers the clam beds where they feed. Hunger sometimes drives them to kill young belugas and narwhals.
powerful rays of light penetrate the melting ice and trigger an explosion of minute planktonic life. Arctic giants arrive to feast on these tiny creatures when strong currents flush billions of them from under the ice. In this group, there are 11 bowhead whales feeding together in a V-shaped formation, behavior which has never been documented in Lancaster Sound. Each whale's slipstream channels food to the companion behind. It is the most effective way to trawl the area, and it shows a remarkable degree of group coordination. favorite quarry of whalers, Bowhead suffered 200 years of relentless persecution. They were nearly wiped out, and there are only a few hundred left in this area. These 60-foot long whales feed almost exclusively on copepods, tiny crustaceans, smaller than a housefly. When a bowhead feeds, its gape is the size of a garage door. The fact that this giant thrives on one of the Arctic's tiniest creatures is incredible, but the bowhead is fantastic in many other ways. Last year, a dead bowhead was estimated to be 210 years old. Like the bowheads, kittiwakes and fulmers flock to the ice edge in Lancaster Sound to plunder the rich waters. They are joined by Brunix guillemots, which, like all orcs, are most at home in water. After a deep breath, they dive for up to three minutes under the ice in search of small cod. Commotion attracts a powerful predator. Polar bears are capable of killing belugas and narwhals, but bowheads are beyond consideration. Birds aren't, though. Thank you. 
guillemots can dive to safety, but bears can dive for guillemots. For such meager rewards, it's just not worth the effort. After hours of feeding, the bowheads now start to socialize. These huge whales are very tactile, especially when they are courting. This is the first time that a pair of bowheads mating has been documented. one knows what sex it is or what it is doing, but it is intriguing. After viewing this footage, some scientists are now wondering if bowheads sometimes form pair bonds. Previously, they were thought to have only polygamous relationships. Much of the ice whales' lives remain a mystery. The little we do know makes them compelling. The sun is ever present in summer, but not always visible. The weather in the high Arctic is unpredictable. Thick fog, squalls and storms are not uncommon even now. The walrus are untroubled. The ice has retreated just enough to uncover their feeding grounds and now they are making up for lost time. Strong currents unleash their power on the melting ice from below, and winds of up to 100 miles an hour pound it from above.
out in open water, the bowheads appear to enjoy the rough seas. At last, Lancaster Sound breaks up. The mosaic pieces of the vast ice fields are swept out to sea. Deep and sheltered fjords along the borders of the Sound are still frozen, but new cracks form inroads to these remote inlets. Now the fabled animal of the Arctic moves in from open waters. The clefts in the ice lead to a well-stocked larder of Arctic cod. Using their remarkable sonar capabilities, the narwhals make repeated sorties under the ice to find and capture fish and squid. In the fields, the narwhals also hunt polar cod. These are deep water fish. The narwhals are able to descend to great depth to catch them. On the bottom of the sea, near the shore, billions of tiny crustaceans multiply. These miniature shrimp-like creatures are the major food of the cod and therefore vital to both narwhals and belugas. Considering these waters never get far above freezing, and it's pitch black down here for half the year, an incredible variety and abundance of life prospers under the ice.
At the surface, this is the time that male narwhals come together to joust, to cross tusks, pitch tooth against tooth in a strange slow motion ritual. The tusk, an obvious sign of maleness and maturity, may be a status symbol which assigns dominance in narwhal hierarchy. Many narwhals spend much of the summer in the fields. Here, females with newborn young are protected. These are the narwhals' chosen nursery grounds. While their relatives are in the deep inlets, the belugas move west through Lancaster Sound. They are heading for traditional, sheltered and shallow estuaries. The first to arrive congregate at the entrance of the bays, waiting for the last of the ice to melt so that they can gain access to the shallows. Prior to entering the bays, the female belugas give birth. Newborn beluga instinctively swims to the surface, but as a precaution, its mother positions herself beneath her baby to ensure it gets several good breaths. The estuarine waters are a few degrees warmer than the open ocean. Even so, the ability of the calf to survive the thermal shock of birth, exchanging the blood-warm comfort of its mother's womb for the icy sea is incredible. Females with young seek each other out and group together. For the first month, the calf often rides around on its mother's back. For up to two years, it will rarely venture far from her side. As soon as the entrance is free of ice, usually in early July, the belugas head up to the far end of the bay. The males also band together and are very sociable at this time.
Belugas come to these bays for their annual molt. Their skin is yellow and wrinkled when they arrive. They congregate in the currents of the rivers flowing out into the bay. The warmer, fresh water is thought to stimulate blood circulation and help soften and loosen old skin. They then head for the shallows. To speed up the molt, the whales roll around, rubbing off their sloughing skin on the muddy and gravelly bottom of the bay. All over their range, belugas molt at this time. Once the old skin is shed, they appear gleaming white. As the tide recedes, the belugas move further out into the estuary and deeper water. But one youngster left it too late and is in serious trouble. The stranded young beluga is desperate to return to deeper water. Helpless out of its element, it is vulnerable to polar bear attack. Its only hope of rescue is the returning tide. When whalers had hunted bowheads virtually to extinction, they turned to belugas to compensate for their losses. In the early 1900s, Scottish whalers operating in the Northwest Passage drove 10,000 belugas into this shallow estuary. Their bones lie bleached and untouched on the beach to this day. Stranded belugas are easy prey for polar bears. What they leave behind, an arctic fox will finish. The yearling is alive and seems unhurt. Its long ordeal is nearly over. Six hours have passed. 
The tide has turned and is coming in fast. Out in the bay, the adult belugas can't help. It is impossible to interpret this cacophony of sound. But as the youngster is reunited, the whole group is clearly excited. It's July. After so many months locked in solid, unyielding ice, all around there is now movement and growth. Lancaster Sound is now ice-free. The belugas have completed their moat and the babies are old enough to cope with the open sea. Narwhals join the belugas in the deep water a few miles offshore. come here to feed. Recent research with satellite transmitters indicates that the belugas are diving down to trenches over half a mile deep in some places. Before they dive, the whales empty their lungs. They can survive without breathing for up to 20 minutes by storing oxygen in their blood and muscles. Exactly what they are diving so deeply for is unknown. The camera has yet to follow them into this arctic abyss. It's thought they are after cod, Greenland halibut, and maybe even squid, worms and shrimp. Whatever it is down there must be plentiful to be worth so great an effort. To withstand the pressure at such depths, the whale's lungs and ribcage are believed to collapse. As the animal ascends, the air in its lungs expands and it reaches the surface back to normal. Young belugas suckle for over a year and stay in close contact with their mother for up to four years.
The babies are born grey and gradually lighten. Not until they are seven or eight are they pure white. It's only August, but already there's a chill in the air. It's time for the whales to leave their summer haunts and migrate back down Lancaster Sound. All across the waterway, animals are on the move. When the sun touches the horizon, the narwhals and belugas have reached open water beyond the entrance of the sand. Some of the bowheads are further south. In late summer, they congregate in a special bay where the feeding is exceptionally good. This will be their last gathering before the onset of winter. In this sheltered inlet, the whales relax and sleep. Their bow-shaped jaws enclose the largest mouth in the animal kingdom. The dominant males make their presence felt. The teenagers group together and indulge in long bouts of sexual play. The sounds they make are haunting and wonderful. In the underwater canyons at the entrance of the bay, the tides concentrate billions of copepods, and this is the main reason why the bowheads come here. But it is not the only incentive. The killer whale is the bowhead's only natural predator. Its high dorsal fin makes traveling in broken ice dangerous so it rarely ventures into the bay, which is never completely ice-free. All the ice whales are at risk. This beluga escaped. The scar on its belly is there for life. This one has lost chunks from its back. And this bowhead is missing the ends of its tail fluke. Eventually, the bowheads will have to head for open water. They will then be vulnerable to attack. Killer whales may be limiting these bowheads rate of recovery. The 
ice whales depart as access to their food closes in the fading light. The whales now head south for the areas of constantly shifting ice in Baffin Bay. The surface is crystallizing. Soon it will solidify. of the sun is coming to an end. By late winter, the top of the world will be ice covered. Six million square miles will be frozen solid. We are just beginning to learn where the ice whales go and what they do for the few short summer months. For the rest of the year, the dark days, the lives of these fabulous creatures remain an unfathomable mystery.